my mom had me do way too much. Gymnastics, piano, brownies, dance. I'm, and I finally got to an age where she said, you have to pick one. Thank you, Jesus. Gymnastics. <laughs> but the problem was, she knew what she needed to do as a parent. She needed to, to expose me to so many things so that I would have the information to make the decision that it was gymnastics. Encouraging a good, healthy balance between them as being an athlete, their school, and my gym, we, if you, if your grades drop below a C, you go on academic probation. Do not bring an F to me because you will be suspended. But I don't just do that. I bring tutors in to give them the help that they need to get, because your education is number one. Gymnastics is going to be over one day, and then what? Mm -hmm. they got to have that to fall back on. And as for nursery, you all are doing that anyway. Just continue to be nurturers. Teach, teaching them. In teaching, we also have to learn when to let go. You know, it's that old King Roger song, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. <laughs> you got to be able to do that. And that's hard. When you see your baby crying or frustrated, the immediate thing a parent wants to do is fix it. Think again about when you were a child and that happened to you, but your parents always run to you and fix it. And it was hard for them not to be able to do that because that's just a natural instinct. Even as a coach, they're not my kids. Believe it or not, I don't even have any kids that I that are biologically mine, but I am a surrogate for thousands of kids. And I take that. There are some things I'm going to watch you, and you may fall, and if you get scratched up, we're going to put a Band-Aid on it. But I'm not going to sit up here and be your cushion every time because that's not serving them a purpose for life. And then the S is for smiling at, and I look up the T, the growth and the glow. You cannot frown when you're smiling. You can't say something negative when you're smiling. And smiles are contagious. What means the most to your child is not your coach smiling at them. It's you smiling at them. You complimenting when they are growing, when they are glowing. Okay? And they have a role too. Okay? So I am a part of PCA, Positive Coaching Alliance, and they have some great tools, and I'm going to share some of those with you all. But one of them is called being a triple impact competitor and what that requires. Okay? Along with the commitment and the sacrifice, there's three levels. There's self, there's teammates, and then the sport. That order is not arbitrary. That is the order. The order is for them to always be committed to themselves, self-improvement, and looking for ways to perform. Now, I have some kids when they are in practice and it's just an off day for them and they're not giving their all. I give them that extra push. If that doesn't work, I'm not going to browbeat them like, do we need to take a wellness day? It's okay. Because gymnastics is 90% this. And if this isn't well, the skills are not going to come out. And that's going to frustrate them more. It is very difficult, though, for an athlete to take time away. They feel like if they are going to take time away, they're going to lose something. They're going to miss something. And that's not true. You helping them to understand that taking care of their mental wellness is the best thing that they can do for themselves, that is going to be great. So teammates, helping your teammates through their positive reinforcement and by prioritizing success, and focusing and helping on others. You all as adults have experienced that outwardness. When you are extend, extending kindness and compassion, what happens? It boomerangs back. That's that law of reciprocity. Okay? So what you give out, it comes back to you. So if you're getting a lot of negative things, the first thing you do is hold that mirror up in front of your face and you're like, what am I doing? What's going on with me? Teach your kids that. We all know I've been a child. You all been children. We have that selfish part. And if you're an only child, you have you don't have anybody to share with. So it's a skill that if you were for the opportunity to be on a team, that you can foster that in them. And then there was then the sport itself. Obviously, the rules, the competitions, the judges, and the teammates and themselves, that's all understood. What I mean collectively about the sport is that you want to teach your athletes that they want to leave something better than the way it was when they got there. That is a life skill. That's not about the sport. That is about making a difference and making an impact because you were there. 
And when you're not there, you are missed. But you're not missed for the wrong reasons. You're missed because the energy drops. The energy drops for the coach. The energy drops for the teammates. And then for the athlete themselves. So I've talked about three things. And there is this thing called the magic of the triad. In the middle is the vision and the purpose. And I stated that in the very beginning. When you are looking for a gym, you want to look for a gym that aligns with your core values, not the coaches. It is the core values. Because that's who, what you are instilling in your athletes. So if you're in a gym where there's, you've got some frustrations with it, take a step back and say, does this align with my core values? So what is the goal, okay? We know that those people who are motivated, that participate in sports, that's going to set the environment. That's what I just said. And so it can be described as a continuous process of positive interaction between all three. Now, I mentioned COVID, and COVID changed a lot. One thing that I can tell you from a coach in a director position with my athletes, they are scared. The constant news of COVID and death, especially that first year of dying, and let's think about if one of their coaches got COVID and at the beginning they were seeing all the deaths, that was going through their mind. And it is traumatizing for them. I mean traumatizing for them. I caught COVID and was out for a long time. I had double pneumonia. I was out for eight weeks, and then I had long COVID for six months after that. So I am a miracle standing here. And so to that point, me being the director and the head coach, that changed. I no longer can coach now. I don't have the energy and the stamina to put in those kind of hours lifting those kids up and down. It changed me. And that was very difficult for me to be able to wrap my mind around it. Now, I'm an adult, grown, been grown for a long time. If I can wrap my mind, my grown mind around that, think about your child. And they're witnessing this, and they're not pouring it out. They're not talking. Because you're like, well, how was practice? It was okay. It was fine. Well, what you do? Well, stuff and things, you know. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, uh, That's when your child's like, I don't want to go. I'm, it, I, why? I just don't. That's all they're going to tell you. But it's coming from that. Most often this revolves around the coaches need to win. Now let's just, that's the biggest thing sitting here in the room, okay? Nobody wants to lose. <coughs> there has to be a healthy balance, though. It can't be win at all costs because the cost is your child. And again, gymnastics is not going to be able to do gymnastics forever. It's a season. The parent is the bow and the athlete is the arrow. Think about that. You are a bow. Where are you projecting your child to go? So you want to send them as far as possible in the right direction, but don't try to make your child like you. You want to hear all these mini-me's? No. <laughs> They're not a mini you. They might look like you and they should, they're your child, but they are not a mini you in the aspect of how you think, how you're gonna react. If you never did gymnastics, you can't relate on that aspect with them, right? So just think about you drawing the boat and you wanna send them in the right direction. Well, you might be saying, well, that's why I'm here, but what is the right direction? You might not know a thing about gymnastics or you might know a little bit about gymnastics, but one thing you know a whole lot about, being a parent. Do that. They have coaches. Parent from that. Because when that intuition is like something's not right, listen to it. Don't silence them. And I have told my parents that many a time. I have sent girls to other gyms. I'm like, the door's open. If it doesn't, if if it doesn't work, she can always come back. Now they have to do something I'll close the door on. But <laughs> that's very few and far between. Because I know that I educate my parents. And I know that that's not going to happen everywhere, right? 
And so you, I had my level mind gymnast. I was like, baby, you need to go. And you're the only one on this team. You need somebody else that can do things you can't do. That motivation of the inward, intrinsic motivation of let me dig a little bit deeper. She was going one week. I got a text from the dad. Can she come back? She doesn't like it. So when she came back, I said, baby, what happened? Well, they're not fun. They don't know how to laugh. <laughs> that was the first thing that she said. But what would have happened if I had not left that door open for them to come back? She probably would have left the sport. And that athlete that I'm talking to you about, she also ran track and did pole vaulting. She got a scholarship in for, for her schooling in pole vaulting. It wasn't that gym, gymnastics coaches weren't buying for her, but she found something else that she loved because I left that open for her. She finished college in three years, got a scholarship to Auburn University, things happened, and now she's going to go to Virginia Tech and pole vault. You want to remind the advocate the importance of succeeding academically. I already mentioned to you that in my gym, that is the number one thing. When we do a banquet, they get awards, trophies that are this tall for their academic excellence. Their gymnastics awards are on paper. Why do I do that? It's intentional. I want their memory from their gymnastics to be that someone cared about my sport. I'm telling you right now, Corinne ain't going to uh, she's not going to come recruit your child if they're not doing well in school. She can't. So that has to be the number one priority. And I remember in my life, I would be dog tired after a four-hour practice, crawl up on my bed and curl up, and the door would open. Have you done your homework? I can't. I can't keep my eyes You want to stay in gymnastics? Yes, ma'am. And I'll get it done. Student athletes who want to play in college must proactively seek those opportunities. They have to seek. There's rules, and you all know that. The college coaches can't contact them until they are contacted first in their junior year. So no matter how bad you might want them to do it in college, this isn't yours. They have to, they have to want to do that. You can guide them. And by reducing the pressure of them having to stop. Okay, there are many plans out there now that can help fund your child's scholarship um, and their experience in college. And just reassure them and let them know, baby, if you want to go to school, don't wear the burden of you having to get a scholarship to do so. Because the truth of the matter, if you are to study what scholarships provide these athletes, it's not everything. It is a portion, and we all know a little bit helps. But in a child's mind, until they are educated on what the scholarship will provide, they will think my schooling will be paid 100% by the scholarship, and that is not true. Also, sharing with them, I know Division I schools are like really big and popular, but the reality is, if you're on a Division I, unless you are knocking it out on your events, you're going to be somewhere down there on the lineup. You got too much competition. Open their minds to Division Two and lower Division Three schools that have gymnastics. So here are four tips to help your athletes balance their athletic identity in order to recognize that I matter aside from gymnastics. Okay? Ask them what are you good at and what are you interested in besides gymnastics. Now, when you first ask that question, they're going to say nothing. I only want to do gymnastics. And your response is, baby, I understand. And I am so glad you are in love with the sport. I want you to open your mind to other things. It's not that you are cheating on gymnastics, okay? It's just that you are getting, you're giving yourself an experience. Encourage them to try new things not related to their sport. And don't be afraid to be imperfect or, pay, or fail. Got another misspelling. Mm -hmm. In terms of that, again, I'll reflect back on to my experience. I didn't understand it at the age of 9 and 10, why my mom was having me do all of that. I do now, but then it was like a burden. The other thing is when I was in gymnastics, there weren't very many sports available to females. <coughs> Not at all. There are now. For instance, if your daughter ever says to you or your son says that there's something in high school that they want to participate in, encourage that. And even if it's not the same sport, which I encourage it not be, that cross-training is very good for them. It's good for them mentally. It's good for them physically. How many of you 
you all have had teachers and coaches say, I want your child on my track team, or I want your child to do this, because they're so agile, they're so flexible, they're so mentally sound. Encourage that with them. Again, you want to seek out a community of people who can support the development of your child. Okay, that can look like <coughs> other coaches from other sports. That can look like a mindset and performance coach, which is what I do. There's lots of people out there that can help. And you want to look for ways to improve your relationships and not just your performance. Again, performance is going to be a portion of their life, but being able to develop healthy relationships and what that looks like is key. And I can tell you that having had male coaches, if my male coaches would not have been nurturing and all of those things that I had previously, I would have a different outlook on men. Yes, I have my father, but if I'm spending 20, 30 hours a week with this person, it can't help but to rub off on me what I see, how I see them treating other females. That's going to be very important. There are some tools I mentioned to you, and these are some of the books that I recommend that you get. You can get these on Amazon, Thrift Books. But Positive Sporting Parents, and it's a quick read. It's got, yeah, I mean, you go through it really quick, and the applications aren't, it's not like this whole thesis that somebody wrote. Changing the Game, this is talking about through um, their actions, okay? How to talk to kids so kids can listen and listen so kids will talk. That is the name of the book. And that is a tool that you all should probably have in all of your houses, regardless of whether or not your child is in sports. It's just trying to speak your language, because it's a whole different language. Some of the things that I do get them to open up and talk to me about, I sit there and I wonder, what made them think that? What was it? And I do ask more powerful questions to get to the root of it. But again, that just applies to parent and child, okay? Here's a QR code for this right here. I remember just telling you that I was, that I was part of the Positive Coaching Alliance. They actually have a course for you to take. That's this course. The course is only $30, and it is a deep dive into parenting athletes. It is an excellent, excellent course. Anyone else need to get the QR code? If you can't, if it's not showing up, you can come closer. And for this right here, if you want to learn more about anything that I've just said or about me and what I do as a mindset, confidence, and performance coach, that's how you're going to get in touch with me. I have worked with lots of gymnasts. I have worked with volleyball players. I have, it crosses the gamut. And the youngest one that I, my youngest client so far was five. Five years old. She was so competitive that she was not enjoying life. And that one was, it made me sad. So I'm like, at five years old, what is going on? The parents were at their wit's end. They're like, we don't know what else we can do. And we worked together. She's now cheering because she got to the point where she found her voice. And she could talk to her parents, and the parents listened. She was great in gymnastics, but it wasn't her passion. She was just super talented. And I know how frustrating that is to see a, a gymnast with super talent that I can, that I know will go far, and for them to say, I just don't want to do it. Think about yourself as an adult. There are plenty of things that you're really good at, but you're like, I wouldn't get a job in that. I don't, I don't want to do that every day. I'm good at it. I've got the skills. I can. But I don't want to. Same thing with these kids. It's the same exact way. So I'm going to, I know we've got a few more minutes. We've got about 10 minutes. And then if there's any questions that I can answer for you, I, I will. As I said, I'm going to be finishing up with your athletes. With, I'm doing goal setting with them this afternoon. And the last session that I do with them kind of eats up a little bit of that panel. But I'll get over there as quick as I can. If there's a question that you didn't get to ask here, and I'm not there yet, write it down and give it to them on the way into the door, and they're going to hand it to me when I walk in. So 
So for right now, with the little bit of time that we have, what's a question that I can help someone with? Yes, ma'am. Talk loud. Um, can you stand up for them so that they can all hear? Thank you, if you're able to. Thank you. You mentioned about um, doing another sport. Uh, how do you fit in another sport? <laughs> <laughs> So that's a good point. Your child has said to you, I want to do another sport. In your gym, the culture is it's gymnastics and nothing else. As a director, I'm going to put on that hat, what I would suggest doing is talking with the coach. And this is the way that we like to be talked to. I know that this is your policy. I understand why you feel that way. I also feel that it's equally important for my daughter to be able to have a full, well-rounded experience. This is what the volleyball schedule is going to look like. She's not going to miss all of the practices, but she will miss these. And see if they're able, if they're open to that. Because with my athletes, when they come to me, they want to do cheer, they want to do volleyball, they want to do swimming, softball, Whatever it is, I have appreciated when the parents have brought me the schedule because then I know what I'm working with. I know their abilities too, but I, if, it's a, if it's a great coach, which I'm sure it is, they're going to understand having that athlete go and participate in something different is far greater than risking losing them at all. And that's the mindset that I come from. I want them to have that experience. And when it can't work out and there's a conflict, guess whose job it is to choose? Not mine. <laughs> It's, and it's not yours. It's your athletes. But don't guilt them. That's the one thing. You've got to do it without guilt. And say, baby, you've got a gymnastics meet and you've got a volleyball game. Which one do you want to do? Sometimes that which one you want to do comes really weighted. You can get to the which one you want to do without accenting those words. Say, this is what we are able to do with both. Tell me what you would like to do. And whatever it is, I'm going to support you either way. I saw another, was that helpful? Yes. Okay. So even kind Can of you stand up because the ones in the back can hear me? So kind of to that point, um, my daughter at level three and four was putting in 17 hours a week. And I just thought that was the most ridiculous thing ever. And so she, she, has always liked music, she's always liked theater, she's always liked, you know, all these different things. And so finally, it was not till like level five or level six where we were like, you know, we really need to look into, you know, all of the hours, but by level five and six, the hours were just- Well, I can only imagine, I mean, she was sleeping there. Yeah, she was, and then it was,